Great the Heat. It is a pleasure to be here to welcome you today as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of an incredible piece of art, but a more incredible piece of history. You know it was just five score and nine days ago to the day that 40,000 people gathered in this very spot to hear President Theodore Roosevelt welcome and greet the huge crowd as they unveiled the statue of the seated Lincoln. As I said, not only is it an incredible piece of art, an incredible sculpture, it's also an incredible moment in time and an incredible piece of history that we're so glad to be here today to pull all of you together. And I see the historian of all historians nodding his head in agreement, pull you all together as we unveil it and rededicate it again, completely refurbished and as beautiful as ever. And we're going to start with the honor guard from the sheriff's office, the award-winning honor guard from the sheriff's office. So ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise as they come in to present the colors. Thank you so much. Mark Beckett, who has an incredible voice, he's an incredibly gifted and talented artist who also lead us in singing the national anthem. Mark? Oh, say can you see by oh, dawn's early light what so proudly we hear at the twilight Whose broad stripes and bright star through the perilous fire for the rocks we watch were so gallantly into this hallowed place at this hallowed time for this hallowed unveiling we thank you even now God for even this president that we're unveiling who through arduous and contemptuous and very divisive times led this country to one of the greatest points of its American history we thank you for our elected officials that stand before us we ask that you continue to give them the guidance to lead us with wisdom guidance 
We thank you for our county exec and his administration, who has continued to not just put Essex County first in New Jersey, but throughout this country. Continue to give them the guidance and the leadership that will continue to lead the people of Essex County in the right direction. Bless the residents of Essex County, the state of New Jersey, and may God bless America. In God's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Reverend Ron. Now, when Teddy Roosevelt was here a hundred years ago, they did the program where they had an invocation and they had an opening. We're trying to be as historically correct as possible. And what he decided to do was what we've decided to do, to do the unveiling prior to hearing from the speakers. And we're going to ask our speakers to be brief out of respect for the fact that it is sweltering here today, although they didn't have that kind of temperature a uh, hundred years ago. But we're going to ask, and I'm going to call your name and ask you to come and line up, and we're going to do an unveiling collectively of our freeholder president, Bonnie R. Watson. Woo! Noted historian and retired Star Ledger reporter, Guy Sterling. Woo! I like to call him the historian's historian, Dr. Clement Price. of this great city of Newark, the Honorable Cory Booker. One of the best governors New Jersey has ever had and with the greatest, sharpest sense of humor imaginable, the Honorable Governor Brendan Byrne. A woman who makes us all walk just a little bit taller and a little bit prouder, our first Lieutenant Governor Evan Lieutenant Governor Ken Guardano. A congressman who makes sure that our voice is heard throughout not only the nation, but around the world, the Honorable Donald M. Payne. And the man who never fails to put Essex County first, a man who is truly a statesman, none other than our County exec, Joe DiVincenzo Jr.
that stands tall through the toughest of times. It symbolizes the coming together of people of all races, creeds, religion, and gender for a common goal. The goal of helping to make the county a place we are all proud of. On a personal note, as I leave you, when I first relocated to Newark from Savannah, Georgia in 1962, I vividly recall that first Easter Sunday I spent in Newark. My husband and I taking our then two little girls to the Hall of, the Hall of Records right behind you, and on these, those steps, we took pictures. We then crossed and sat with our daughters on the lap of the statue of Abraham Lincoln. And in awe, and in awe, I marveled at the lifelike face of one of the greatest presidents and not ever having an idea that one day, one day, I would be standing giving remarks at the centennial rededication of Borgham's sitting Lincoln. So my dream and prayers of a better life were answered the day I stepped foot in Essex County. It is my home. It is my life. And it is with great pride that I'm here today on this historic occasion. May God bless you. May God bless Essex County. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freyota Watson. And I'm sure you stirred many memories because there are so many photos of people who've taken pictures, seated with, standing by, holding on to the seated Lincoln. I want to ask Guy Sterling to come forward because we really want to thank you because you have really brought this history home to us. You've provided the historical research on the seated Lincoln statue, and we are so glad that you're here, and we're so glad that you did. Guy? Good afternoon. Governor Byrne, Congressman Payne, Lieutenant Governor Guadagno, County Executive DiVincenzo, Mayor Booker, honored guests, friends, and my fellow Newarkers. A century ago, this past Memorial Day, a crowd of between 25 and 40,000 gathered at this site for the unveiling of, of what has become an American treasure, the seated Lincoln by Goodson Borglum, one of this country's most important and widely known sculptors. The people came out not only to see the statue, but to see and hear Teddy Roosevelt, the only living former president at the time who served as the dedication's keynote speaker. The newspapers estimated that 100,000 spectators lined the roads from the ferry terminal in Hudson County just to see Roosevelt as he traveled by ferry and then open car with Borglum from New York to Newark. Roosevelt gave one of four speeches that day. The others were by Ralph Lum, the attorney who served as chief executor of the estate of Amos Van Horn, the furniture retailer and Civil War veteran from Newark who left $25,000 in his will for this statue. The second speaker was Malon Pitney, chancellor of New Jersey and a former congressman who the following year would be appointed to the United States Supreme Court by President Taft and Newark's mayor at the time, Jacob Housling. In terms of the ceremony's protocol, Lum turned the statue from the Van Horn estate over to Pitney, who accepted it on behalf of Lincoln Post No. 11 of the Grand Army of the Republic, the local Civil War veterans group that Van Horn had helped to start in Newark. The Post then turned it over to the city of Newark with Roosevelt and Housling given the honor of accepting it. Over the course of the past year, as I push to have this day remembered, people have asked me what makes this statue and the dedication so historic. Two main reasons come to mind. The first was the, pres the presence of Teddy Roosevelt, the country's 26th president and a riveting figure in American history. It's very clear from the record, though you won't find it in any book, that the reception Roosevelt got in Newark helped convince him to run again for president in 1912, one of the most interesting presidential elections this country's ever had, and one that ended in the election of Woodrow Wilson. 
And second, of course, is the statue itself. It was a hit from the moment it was unveiled, and in the years since then, has done nothing but grow in stature. It is not a stretch to say that this is the preeminent bronze image of Abraham Lincoln, with Goodson Borglum capturing the great emancipator in a moment of deep reflection as he visits the White House garden to ponder the difficult choices he has to confront in determining the future of a country at war with itself. But also, is there a child in Newark in the last hundred years who has not come here to play, to be photographed by an adoring relative, or to get a quick history lesson? Such visits are not only a local rite of passage, they provided memories lasting a lifetime. This kind of interaction was exactly what Borglum had wanted and hoped for. So I have no problem accepting what the Newark News wrote in an editorial on the 40th anniversary of the statue in 1951, that the Lincoln statue is to Newark what the Eiffel Tower is to Paris and the Houses of Parliament are to London. Before I cede the podium to my good friend Dr. Price, I would like to briefly mention the speech that President Roosevelt gave here 100 years ago. He directed his remarks to two audiences that day. One was the small number of aging Civil War veterans in the crowd who had marched that morning in 1911 with 5,000 others in Newark's annual Memorial Day parade. Many of these veterans were so old or infirmed that they needed canes, crutches, or the help of a son to get them past the reviewing stand. The president cited the call of duty these men had answered in fighting for the Union and proclaimed them an example for all Americans to follow in pursuing just causes. In speaking to his larger audience, Roosevelt also emphasized how much duty had meant to Lincoln. Roosevelt said that in his reading of Lincoln's speeches, he discovered that for every one time Lincoln mentioned a right, he mentioned duty ten times. Roosevelt called upon Americans to ded dedicate themselves to the ideals for which Lincoln had stood, saying, We prove our faith in him and his teachings, not merely by praising him for what he did in facing the issues of a buried past, but by working in his spirit, his spirit of love of liberty, of love of justice, and of insistence upon order as the handmaid of liberty and justice. Both Borglum and the President left the proceedings that day emboldened by their experience in Newark, Roosevelt to seek the nation's highest office once more, and Borglum later to carve the presidential faces on Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota. But neither man, as he continued his epic career, ever forgot what happened on this spot. Over the course of the last several months, I've had a number of email exchanges with Robin Carter, Borglum's granddaughter, who has written about his life and work. She couldn't, couldn't be here today, so I asked her if there was anything she'd like me to say on her behalf. Her response was to provide me with two quotations, one from President Roosevelt and the other from her grandfather, about what this statue came to mean to them over time. In a letter to a friend well after the unveiling, Roosevelt wrote this. Let me say that the more I see of that, that statue of Lincoln, the greater I regard it as a work of real art, the lofty soul of a great man expressed as only a genuine artist could express it. I am very glad to have had a chance of being connected with this dedication. And according to the sculptor, in the second quotation Robin Carter sent me, creating art was precisely what Borglum had in mind in creating this statue. He wrote the following in 1915. I was determined to, to try the experiment of creating a piece of museum sculpture for the public square instead of the conventional monument and see what happened. I am pleased to say it has been a complete success. I don't think I have got a statue in the country as a piece of art that my conscience reverts to and my heart reaches out and surrounds as naturally and as often as the Newark Lincoln. 
May our hearts today be equally inspired in appreciating and caring for this icon of America, and in making certain it continues to stand here as a beacon of justice, fairness, equality, and mercy, not just for the next hundred years, but for hundreds of years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Guy, for that walk down history's lane. They say that those who forget their history are destined to repeat it. And here's a man right here in Newark, in Essex County, who never lets us forget our history, and that is our good friend, Dr. Clement Price. Thank you, Joyce. Oh, my. Look at this crowd. Uh, Guy, that was just a wonderful presentation. On behalf of our fellow citizens, I commend you and thank you. My fellow citizens, when Gustav Borglum's statue of a seated Abraham Lincoln was unveiled a century ago, the stature of the martyred president had taken on a more deeper, a, deep, more, a deeper and more complicated meaning. A few years earlier, in 1908, a group of white progressives and the great black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois had convened a commemorative uh, meeting to observe the centennial anniversary of Lincoln's birth. They did that, and they also lamented the state of race relations in America at that time. At that time, they started a new organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And in 1922, when Lincoln's image and our memory of him had been monumentalized, one of the grandest artistic statements in the American Republic, the Lincoln Memorial, was opened to the public. By that time, when, when Americans thought of Abraham Lincoln, they thought of him not as the great conciliator, or even as the man who saved the Union. He had been transformed into the great emancipator. We now know that Lincoln was deserving of such a mantle. For over the course of his public life, he grew into the presidency. He learned much of the essential immorality and indecency of slavery. And when the time came, he put the nation on a path that would take it, take it to the beginning of a reconciled, recognizable form of democracy. Bor Borglum could not have known when his statue of President Lincoln was unveiled a hundred years ago, what the 20th century would make of Lincoln, the Lincoln he so obviously admired. But our collective affection for President Lincoln caught up with his. Over the years and the decades that were to follow 1911, the monumentalized Lincoln would become at once iconic and a reminder of the nation's unfinished business on matters democratic and on matters informed by justice. We would be reminded of those matters again on Easter Sunday, 1939, when Marian Anderson sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And we would be reminded once again when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech on those very steps. Closer to home, Borglum's statue of our Abraham Lincoln reminds us of those things and the importance of public art to civic culture in a democratic society such as ours. Today, just a few weeks after the beginning of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, there's something else to remember how closely tied is Lincoln to what he called the new birth of freedom that the war and he made possible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Price. Abraham Lincoln was a real lover of music, and he often asked people to, in the most troubling times, to either sing 
or play an instrument. So we're going to have a musical interlude, a real treat, no pun intended, from the Harriet Tubman School's String Ensemble.
next speaker is someone who is committed, I'm sure, to supporting arts education in the Newark Public Schools, and that's the mayor of Newark, Cory Booker. And we are going to ask, I see people getting a little woozy there, our speakers to be, to be brief. So uh, from this great statue to South Park in Newark, what is South Park? It is a park that was renamed uh, years after Lincoln's death to Lincoln Park. Uh, I am so pleased to know that Lincoln's presence in the city is clear, is present, and still drives our convictions to make this nation more true. Uh, Bob Marasco, our city clerk, is here, and it really is my credit to him to making this my favorite statue when he presented to me uh, a replica of this upon my uh, election as mayor of the city of Newark. And for that, I am grateful. I want to just end with a very short uh, uh, vignette. After Lincoln had given the inaugural address, uh, his second famous inaugural address, he went back to a courtyard. And there was one black man that was invited to the ceremony, and Lincoln had, a, had trouble uh, finding him. People were trying to pull him this way and that. The historical record I read of it said the, the governor of Rhode Island really wanted to speak to the, to the president. But Lincoln insisted that he find his friend. This was a friend of his that had a difficulty getting in there. Somebody recognized who he was and brought him into the reception. He sat humbly uh, off to the side, even though he stood regal in stature. Lincoln walked over to the man and said, Sir, I must know what you thought of my speech. And the man looked at him and said, Mr. Lincoln, you have guests to attend to. And Lincoln insisted, you must tell me what you thought of my speech. And this would be the last time the two men would speak, because soon after, Lincoln, obviously, as you know, would be assassinated. The man was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass grabbed Abraham Lincoln by the hand and looked him firmly in the eye and said, Mr. President, it was a sacred effort, a sacred effort. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, who made this their sacred duty to give honor to a century of standing strong as the seated Lincoln. I want to thank everyone who is committed to giving their true measure of their devotion to this city to make the principles of Lincoln still herald throughout our land. And finally, I want to say with malice towards none and definitely in this heat with charity towards all, thank you. A true gift mayor, the gift of brevity. Thank you very, very much. And now we hear from someone who is one of the wittiest, I guess one of the best governors we've ever had, one of the wittiest, most clever governors, Governor Brendan Byrne. Thank you very much. Well, I heard that they refurbished the old president. Uh, <laughs> I asked them if they could do that for old governor. <laughs> and uh, they said they would look into it. I, I once, I once uh, checked on uh, Lincoln's humor because he had a lot of humor. And I'll just tell you one story that I used that I got from Abraham Lincoln. Not at the time. <laughs> but he, he told the story about the time, the ancient time, when the ancient king went out to hunt, and before he went out, he called in his royal weatherman and asked him if it was going to be nice weather, and the royal weatherman assured him that it would be. And as he started out, he saw an old man on a, on a donkey. The man on the donkey said, better not go out, it's going to rain. So the king said, well, the royal weatherman told me it's got to be bad. It's got to be uh, clear. So the king went out and it rained. So he fired the royal weatherman, calls for the guy in the donkey and offers him the job. And the, royal weather, and the guy said, no. He says, uh, your, your majesty, it wasn't me, it was my donkey. If his, if his ears are up, it's going to be clear. If his ears are down, it's going to rain. So the king offers it, makes the uh, donkey the royal weatherman. And Lincoln said that's where he made his mistake. Because ever since then, every jackass thinks he's entitled to a political job. <laughs> of 
always has a memory of like an eye spent eight years looking out that window up there, admiring Abraham Lincoln as we admire him today. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Lincoln was one of the, the, the few early presidents who really had um, a tremendous and vocal respect for women uh, and women in leadership roles and women in leadership positions. And I think he would have been so proud, Lieutenant Governor, to have you here today representing the great state of New Jersey. Thank you so much. On behalf of the governor of the state of New Jersey, I just wanted to say thanks for having me. There's a piece of the history I thought that the doctor would tell you. And what you need to know is that 50 years before this statue was placed here in Newark, the Republican president of the United States accepted an invitation from a legislature who did not vote for him to come to Newark, to Trenton and say hello to those that he needed to befriend. And that was literally 50 years before, and he stopped here first on his way down to Trenton. And so what I'd like to do today in honor of that 50 years before the 100 year commemoration, because that's why Lincoln was here. He was here to make his way down to Trenton to say hello and embrace his enemies. I wanted to bring you a replication of the invitation the legislature sent inviting the not yet sworn in president of the United States to come and speak to them. And that's the reason why Lincoln stopped here 50 years before this statue was put here. And let me just tell you that he was truly a humble man as we've been talking about, because I won't read to you the invitation, the acceptance of the invitation, except to you, read to you the P.S. And the P.S. part of it is directed to the governor of the state of New Jersey, and it says, P.S., Your Excellency. <laughs> Somebody got that. P.S. P.S., please arrange no ceremonies for my visit because that would be a waste of time. So on that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to hand to you the invitation, the acceptance of the invitation of Lincoln to attend because but for this acceptance, Jody, we would not have a statue here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> We're coming into the, to the, the home stretch, and we couldn't start the home stretch with a better person than our own Congressman Donald M. Payne, who is the living embodiment and a real testimony to all that Abraham Lincoln stood for. So please welcome to the podium Donald M. Payne, our Congressman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joyce, who always does such a fantastic job uh, presiding at these events, let me certainly commend uh, our County Executive Joe DiFincenzo, who has really made this area around this Essex County complex a place that we can be, be so proud of with the uh, new statues and with the refurbishment of our buildings and the beautiful greenery uh, that we see here. And so just keep up the good work, Joe. Let me uh, also uh, commend those young people. You notice how poised they were when their notes flew away. They didn't even phase them. They went on and said, we got a job to do, and we're going to do Harry Tubman, their modeling group, and it certainly would have been impossible without great people like Ms. Terrell, their principal, and she was, uh, she followed Ms. Ali, who brought it to New Heights, and actually it was the concept of a young man, Noah Marshall Jr., who graduated from Barrington High School with me, who started the concept at Harriet Tubman. So I'm just here to say to guys, Sterling, we really appreciate you. Oh, Lord, if we had people like you in journalism and TV today, we'd be in great shape. But we have what we have, and uh, we'll deal with that. Let me just say that it's great to be here 100 years after the celebration of the seat at Lincoln. As you've heard about our outstanding um, uh, uh, designer who made this possible. You heard about the stop that President Lincoln made. But there's a little known fact that Abraham Lincoln had ancestors here who lived in New Jersey. His great-grandfather, uh, 
John Lincoln was born in Freehold, then called Monmouth Courthouse in 1711. And so we have roots here. And so as we gather here, we uh, certainly would uh, want to remember that. As you know, Abraham Lincoln had a tough time in New Jersey, though. Uh, he lost the 1860 election, of course, after the Lincoln-Douglas debates. In 1864, he ran against a Jersey, General McCollum, uh, who uh, uh, won the state. Also, it was interesting in our state legislature, we had a difficult time with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. 13th Amendment, as you know, abolished slavery. 14th gave equal protection under the law, sort of reversal of Dred Scott that said that uh, white men had no, black men had no rights that white men had to respect. And the 14th Amendment said everybody was equal. And the 15th, of course, gave blacks the right to vote. But New Jersey passed it, rescinded it. If you really want to get a good story, Read about New Jersey state legislature. I wish I had time. I'd tell you about it, but it takes too long, and I'm listening to Joyce. But it's interesting how the, the Republicans, who were the party of Lincoln and the party for abolition, passed these outstanding bills, but it was the Democrats who turned them back. So, Governor, you could tell the Governor that uh, when you get back. Let me just say that, uh, uh, just in conclusion, as has been mentioned, Frederick Douglass had a great impact on President Lincoln, he met with them privately and publicly. He was the one to convince him to allow uh, African Americans to really get involved in the Civil War. He said, let them fight for their freedom. And his two sons joined the 54th Regiment of Massachusetts. But let me just conclude by saying that President uh, Taft came, uh, President uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who served, as you know, from 1901 to 1909, uh, preceding Taft, was the one here. But if you look at President Teddy Roosevelt became famous because of the Spanish-American War and at the Battle of San Juan Hill, which was a key battle, believe it or not, Teddy Roosevelt was pinned down with his so-called Rough Riders. Guess who came to the rescue? The Buffalo Soldiers came, made a passageway. It was alleged that the Buffalo Soldiers uh, was the, uh, the, 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 the force that pushed uh, the troops of the opposition back, and Teddy Roosevelt uh, was able to regroup, and the Rough Riders and Teddy Roosevelt was successful. So we see a lot of history involved, and the final thing is that there is a person uh, whose name is DeCarter Dorsey, who was born in Maryland as an enslaved person, but he joined the U.S. Colored Infantry Company B of the 39th Regiment. He is buried in New Jersey. But the thing that's so important about Decatur Dorsey is that he received the Medal of Honor for his work, for his uh, heroism in the Civil War. He was a flag bearer. And flag bearers used to run in front of the troops. So of course the first to get shot were flag bearers. And he was black too. Now this was, this was the battle between the North and the South. As he ran with the flag, he continued to go forward. Uh, the uh, troops pushed them back. The black troops once again went forward again. He captured two flags. And he received the Medal of Honor. He's buried in Hudson County. Uh, and we will, uh, I'm working with the Urban League and NAACP because we want to find out more about it. And we need to, he's the only um, person from that era who was buried there uh, in New Jersey. And, and so what I want to say is that in the Civil War, believe it or not, there were 26 African Americans who received the Medal of Honor. They were recognized for their valor. In World War I, there were none given that honor. In World War II, there were none because it came to the officers to bring forth the record. However, President Bush in 1991 did find that there should be a person named Freddie Stowers who did receive the Medal of Honor uh, and it was presented to him because of his World War I record. And President Clinton, after Shaw University did a study that he asked for to go through records of African Americans World War II, 10 were recommended, 7 were uh, of, of, uh, given the honor uh, of getting the uh, congressional uh, from the, I mean, the Medal of Honor. I happened to be at that ceremony. Only one was living. But it's 
strange to say 26 in the in the Civil War and none in World War One and one World War Two. So sometimes we see that perhaps things in certain areas were a little fairer at that time than they had been in the present. So let me once again commend Joe D for this great uh, opportunity. And I always take the opportunity because my brother had pushed the Amistad legislation and they're not doing it everywhere. So every chance I get, I try to do a little bit of black history. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for the lesson and the information, Congressman. You know, Lincoln was known as a great conciliator, a great emancipator, a great leader. And he understood clearly that there were people who will um, really only record history, and then there are people who go out and make history. He also understood that there were some politicians who only cared about the next election, but a real statesman, a genuine statesman, cares about the next generation. And we have right here in Essex County a true statesman who respects history, honors history, cares about the next generation, builds things for the next generation. And I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please put your hands together for our county exec, Joe D. Thank you very much. First of all, Congressman Payne, thank God you mentioned Bill. Thank God you talked about the committee, because you would have been in a lot of trouble. First of all, welcome to the Essex County Government Complex, the best complex in the state of New Jersey. You know, we have a lot to be proud of here in Essex County. We have over 800,000 residents. We have 22 municipalities. And this particular uh, courthouse, and this complex here is seated right here in Newark, New Jersey, where I was born and raised. And I couldn't be more proud of what we are celebrating today. But last year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the courthouse. This year, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary, of course, the seat of Lincoln. You know, and I just want to thank Guy and uh, my good friend, Price. I forgot your name. I'm sorry again. Clement Price, our historian, uh, both of them do, truly do an outstanding, making sure we never forget. And to our assignment judge, Patricia Costello, I want to thank her for being here and thanking her for being my partner for the last nine years and turning this complex what it is today. Thank you for your support and also to the judges. And to my good friend, Sheriff Armando Vontour, who truly does an outstanding job making sure this complex is secure in all our facilities. To my staff, the 3,500 employees that truly worked their heart and soul out for this great county, I just want to thank them because we've done so much and we have a lot to be proud of here. And to today's program, uh, to our speakers, you know, to the young people that are here, you know, we have the, our lieutenant governor. She's the first lieutenant governor of the state of New Jersey. And 100 years from now, I just said, whispered in her ear, and I said, listen, they're going to be reading about you that, like they read about Teddy Roosevelt, how he unveiled it. So to Kim, I won't be here, but a lot of these young people will be here. I'm sure you'll be in history books. And I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank the governor for being a good friend here in Essex County. And also I want to thank Governor Byrne, who's no question... He is Mr. Essex County. We have a plaza that's named after him. And anytime I call him on him for anything to come here and be supportive, he's always here. And I want to thank his wife, Ruthie Twistle, for being here. Thank you. Congressman Donald Payne, when the history book is written and the things that he's done in his 50 years of community service is outstanding. He also, just like Governor Byrne has a plaza here, Governor of uh, Governor, not yet. Congressman Payne has a plaza. I want to thank you, and to my good friend, Mayor Cory Booker, who we're already reading about him throughout the, uh, throughout the country. He's already in history books, I believe. Are you? Not yet? We're here in every magazine that I open up. But he's been my partner, and there's no question, Newark has made a turnaround, and it's, you know, no one can do the job alone. We all have to work together as a team, and there's no question, he is my younger brother, Mayor Cory Booker. At least I had the opportunity to say that. And to my partner on the Freeholder Board, who's been the president, who's done an outstanding job. When I was the president of the board, 
She was my vice president. She's a very, very good friend of mine. I want to thank her for all her support and leadership. Thank you very much. And to my good friend, Reverend Ron Christensen, my pastor, my friend, thank you once again. Mark Beckett, thank you. To the Harriet Tubman young people, I want to thank you. To our vocational school. Where's the kids from the Essex County Vocational School? How about the Robert Tree Academy? Thank you all for being here. This has been a great event. I know it's been very hot. I just want to thank everyone. And to my good friend, Guy, thank you once again for helping us coordinate this and putting it together. And especially to my staff. We have one more song, right? One more song. Okay. Thank you, Josh, for making things happen here in Essex County. And here is the real treat again, pun intended, the Robert Treat Academy singing God Bless America. Yeah.